I'm the manager of the Internet Project, and one of the co-sponsors of this uh, seminar series. Uh, for those of you that have been here before, pardon me, I'm going to say it once, one more time. The Internet Project really uh, is, the purpose of the Internet Project is to explore the value and the benefit of IT, information technology, in how the community works, plays, lives. Uh, this year we're, we're focusing on uh, what we call smarter health, how information technology can affect the healthcare industry. Uh, I'm not the only sponsor of the seminar series. The other co-sponsor <coughs> is the Education Program for Health Informatics Professionals, who is directed by Dominic Covey. You'll see a little bit more of Dominic at the end of the seminar, uh, today's seminar, uh, when we go into a moderated discussion. This is our third seminar of this series. Uh, we'll take a little hiatus now until after this one, until January, at which time uh, you may have uh, seen the announcement on the table when you uh, came in to register. Uh, and uh, the title of our seminar in January is Achieving a Clinical Dose of IT, How Much IT is Enough? That will be held on January 23rd, uh, not in this room, it will be held in the Farica Auditorium, which is in a building just a little ways from here. So uh, hopefully you won't get lost in trying to find us there. <coughs> that seminar will be by Dominic Cuppy. So I hope to see you all there. Bring all your colleagues and friends as well. Uh, there is actually uh, a new version of the entire seminar series, which gives the dates uh, from January through until the end of April. Uh, with that, uh, David, do you want to say a little bit of, uh, of, about the seminar? Thank you, Shirley. I will. As I look at this uh, list of uh, guests to come, and I've had a chance to have lunch with Craig, and we're in for a wonderful hour, hour and a half with him, and then uh, who we've had before, John Oliver, Jan Steiner. I'm thinking this is an American remark, yeah. but uh, respect for you, Craig, and Jan Steiner, who's from uh, the University of Michigan. As I look at this constellation of talent, reminded of that remark, which was never has so much talent been assembled in one place since Thomas Jefferson died in the world. We should Craig up with the microphone there and ask if he being looked up. I was conscious that sometimes we get these things wrong. One of my favorite stories for the fundraising circuit is the story of a Presbyterian minister in Cape Breton Island, which is Scottish Canada, and the mortgage for the uh, roof of the church was due on a Monday and there was no money to pay for it in this poor community. So uh, the minister prayed for four or five days uh, before the, uh, the Sunday with no answer to his prayers until Saturday night, very late, as he finished his sermon and again praying for an answer to his financial difficulty. The voice said, go to the church. And went to the church and the voice said, uh, wire up the pulpit into each of the seats. And he did that and had the bunch of the pulpit. The next morning he get in, started the sermon, says that the mortgage is due tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We need uh, $4,000 uh, or the church will have to close. Everyone who's prepared to subscribe, $500 stand up now and get the button. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the church stood up except one unfortunate Scotsman who was elected creator to this pew. <laughs> We're glad to have Craig here uh, who will give us yet another perspective on uh, health informatics. Uh, I've been very privileged to attend all of these seminars and attend to attend the balance of them. The richness of ideas in this very rapidly evolving field is uh, just enormous. And we're so fortunate to be able to uh, to have a fraternity of people and a sorority of people involved to share their knowledge. It's another wonderful Jefferson uh, statement. Jefferson said about knowledge, uh, one of the things about knowledge is that it's never diminished. In fact, it's enhanced by sharing. Just like when you light your candle from my candle, my candle is not extinguished and the illumination of the world is even brighter. We're going to be illuminated very beautifully today, Craig, because I've heard you speak for Einstein looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. We are also delighted for this particular seminar series, seminar that uh, it is sponsored by Triple G Systems Inc. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> 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 not really, not really. It was in the audience, obviously, and uh, Paula Kuko, president of the company, will introduce I'll not only introduce the speaker, I would like to say a few words about Triple G. How many of you have heard of Triple G? 
Wow. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's, that's actually pretty good because most organizations that I speak to, most universities that I have the privilege to talk to, have actually never heard of us. So, um, we are privileged to be here sponsoring this particular seminar series, but I would like to spend a few moments and just highlight to you a little bit about Triple G. Triple G is a developer of software that automates and enables clinical laboratories. It is an acronym laden business that we all participate in. We, in short, <coughs> provide an LIS, which is a laboratory information system. Our software enables hospitals of all sizes, clinics, and reference laboratories to automate their complex processes, manage high volumes of data, and provide information and, more important, knowledge back to the healthcare providers so that they can provide better health to the consumers or the patients. We have, um, we design the software, we develop it, we market it, we support it, we install it. We have over 130 customers that operate 340 laboratories across 10 countries. So we are an international organization. Our headquarters is in Toronto, actually Markham, but often when I'm talking people don't know where Markham is. They are in Markham, Ontario, so we are a Canadian-based organization with operations in 10 countries. What benefits does our software provide? We allow laboratories to reduce their operating costs and reduce, if not eliminate, medical errors by automating all manual processes and by enabling very easy retrieval of information and the use of that information to improve outcomes. And Craig is going to talk to you about some of that today. We also allow laboratories to increase utility from investments in other technology assets, often very disparate technology assets that need to be brought together, that need to be integrated in a common clinical repository so once again information can be provided back to the providers improving health for the, for the patients. We also allow laboratories to increase the quality and level of service to their patients by on time, accurate and rapid turnaround on their crucial lab tests and results, thus improving diagnosis and treatment of patients. And all of that is done in the laboratory environment. Triple G's products, we have two product lines. We have Ultra, which is our product for very high volume, large, more complex laboratory environments. And we also have an NT-based product called Trivent that we penetrate smaller, medium-sized hospitals and reference labs with. Our flagship product is the Ultra product. In short, this is how it works. From collection of a specimen, a specimen being blood, those kinds of things that most people don't like to talk about, but from the collection to disposition, each individual specimen is uniquely tagged and identified and rooted throughout various laboratory departments, which can include clin clinical chemistry, hematology, pathology, microbiology. Tests are then performed with a series of automated equipment, diagnostic equipment, Results are then routed back through multiple departments into a single source and provided on user-defined reports back to clinicians so that clinicians can manage that data, make recommendations based on the data, and make recommendations on treatment of individuals. We also then provide all the statistical analysis of those results and do workload measurement statistics which can then be reported back into the system. Um, it's our great honor, and we believe it's very fitting for us to be here at this particular seminar, and it's our great honor to be sponsoring it. We have provided you with some information packages, so please feel free to take any of those. My card is in those packages, so if you have any interest in further information on Triple G and on our products, I'm more than happy to supply it for you. So that's kind of my two minutes. I was given two minutes, which is why I had to write it down, because normally I talk for about an hour on this topic. Um, that's my two-minute pitch on Triple G. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Craig Lehman. Craig Lehman is Professor and Dean of the School of Health Technology and Management at the State University of New York, Stony Brook Campus, campus in Long Island, New York. He has an international reputation for his contributions in lipid research, clinical laboratory integration, diagnostic technology, clinical laboratory economics, and clinical laboratory science education. He's an editor of two clinical laboratory science textbooks and has contributed many journal articles and book chapters and produced an educational video on lab uh, education. We, in fact, have participated with Craig in the writing of some of the textbooks. And, in fact, have participated with Stony Brook by donating our software, the Ultra software, for use 
in Craig's education program. So we're quite honored to have uh, participated in some of those initiatives. Dr. Lehman served as the U.S. Delegate for the American Society for Clinical Lab Science at three world congresses. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of Strategies for the American Association of Clinical Chemistry, the Journal of Clinical Lab Science, and Medical Laboratory Observer. He's also been a consultant to healthcare organizations, uh, pharmaceutical companies, laboratory diagnostic organizations, and healthcare informatics companies like Triple G. Lastly, among all of these very distinct, distinguished accomplishments, <coughs> we at Triple G are very privileged to call him a friend, to call him a supporter, to call him an advisor, and to have him on our board. And with that, I give you Dr. Lehman. Thank you, Paul. I don't want to add more to that, but I think I have to, to explain why I'm here. Uh, I'm not a typical academic individual. And when I say that, that means that I'm in the real world. I mean, I work with plenty of academics who stay in academia and think they know what the real world's about, and they profess to know the answers, and the reality is they really don't. For the last 20 years, I've, one of my tasks, one of my consultant areas, has been to go out and to do what we call workflow analysis of clinical laboratories. And workflow meaning that we would go in and assess the present operations of the lab as far as costs, efficiencies, impact on healthcare, and then to project implementing changes and what that would bring to the institution. One of them being IT, like laboratory information systems. The other is technology. In addition to that, I'm very much involved in a new area, which is very new for me, and I think it's new for healthcare, is the home healthcare industry. So what I plan to do for you is I try to separate my presentation into three components. The first two being rather short and the last segment being a little bit longer. The first segment that I want to talk about is really the change that has happened in healthcare in the United States. What was the catalyst and how did we respond to it in the clinical diagnostic industry? And then give you an example of what workflow is as far as the informatics piece and the economic impact that it can have on a healthcare industry, which is tremendous. And then the second piece that I want to do, I might have these backwards, but I want to talk about the impact of technology and what it means to healthcare, impact that deals with software that really changes the life of a laboratorian. And then the last piece, I'll talk about the present research that I'm doing now and some new technology that is beginning to enter the field which is very timely because of the aging population. So having said that, the catalyst for the change in the United States really was in the early 80s when Reagan came in, and, and you all know it by now, it's the DRGs. But the big change that it made for the laboratory and that the way the laboratory functioned is that it took it from a revenue-producing center in the hospital to a cost center. Big problem, big problem. Because now, we were known prior to that of really generating a lot of money for the hospital. And when w this came in, automatically administration looked at it and says, oh, you have too big of a budget, we're gonna have to start to cut. And the first thing that happened was that the vendors got wind of this and they realized that they were not going to be able to sell technology into the same amount that they had in the past and that they were going to have to help the laboratories consolidate in order to survive the economic changes. So, let's just talk briefly about what are the changes. I don't know why I'm cut off up there, but if you look at outside the laboratory now, we are faced with population trends. We have baby boomers that are going to enter the system and in the United States that means that at some point they will enter the Medicare system in which the government will pay for their health care. Because it's an aged population, the case mix is going to definitely change. And at the same time, because of technology and the cost of providing health care, 
we're leaning more towards an ambulatory care system. And then obviously informatics, which we'll cover a lot, and economics is the driving force. And then if you go inside the laboratory, diagnostic technology has changed drastically. We've gone through a consolidation process, but really the biggest change that's taking place now is what we call point of care testing. The technology that affords us the opportunity to test patients outside of the clinical laboratory. And the other added piece of technology that's infiltrated the laboratory is the pre and post analytical automation where we used to hire a lot of people to handle these samples, to spin the samples down, to pour off the samples and put them in cups and put them on the analyzers. Now the technology is doing that for us. So the labor force in the clinical laboratory, in hopes of keeping it very efficient, is getting smaller and smaller, and it's relying very heavily on IT and diagnostic technology that is consolidated, small, and mobile informatics and economics also there. So what are the strategies that we have used to cut costs? In healthcare, we've gone in many places to an integrated, integrated delivery system. Many hospitals have joined forces to provide healthcare in a particular area of the country. We have definitely decreased the length of stay of our patients who are in the hospital. We are setting up more and more ambulatory clinics and other type of opportunities for patients to keep them away from the hospital. The consolidation of services, meaning the laboratory service, radiology, and we can just go right on that line, but it is a consolidation of services. And of course, the utilization of information technology, very important because it's really taking over the labor components that we have in the laboratory. As far as inside the laboratory, utilization of the state of art of technology. Every time that a piece of technology comes into the laboratory, we hope that it's going to improve efficiency and decrease our costs. And many times that decrease of costs is through the labor component. Laboratorians are expensive, and many times we look to downsize the laboratory to make it more efficient and more cost effective. Uh, we have built a core laboratory. We have standardized our technology throughout our integrated delivery systems. Many of us have gone to lo total laboratory automation where there used to be maybe 60 people in the laboratory, now there's only 40 because it's robotics, there's conveyor belts, but they are the high volume uh, information systems and the laboratory volumes. So this is really what we are building. We are building a community-based healthcare system starting off with the tertiary care teaching facility. This is the core of healthcare. Where I am, we have a 550 bed tertiary care teaching hospital. This is where the PhDs are. This is where the high technology is. This is where the expensive testing is taking place. And in addition, this is where the expensive patient goes to. They do not go to the primary care of the community-based hospital. In the years to come, there will be fewer and fewer tertiary care hospitals due to informatics and due to the technology that's available. The bulk of the hospitals will be primary care or community-based hospitals, and they will do the routine testing for the patients. Again, lower level people. You can't afford to put the PhDs, you can't afford to put a group of pathologists in community-based hospitals any longer. So they're all at the tertiary care. So what does this mean for informatics? It means that I need to move information from my primary care community-based hospitals to the tertiary care hospitals for those questions that need expertise from high level individuals. And then you can work your way all the way down to all the variations of the facilities showing that home health care is on the bottom but it's the largest and it's going to grow and grow and grow at least for 30 or 40 years. And it's something that we all will have to deal with. So the way that we're building an integrated delivery system for laboratory is that if you take my facility, we're a tertiary care teaching hospital. We're doing very sophisticated medicine and diagnostic services. All of the other hospitals in our integrated delivery system are doing less of the sophisticated tests and more of the routine tests. 
So if you come in and you have an appendicitis, more than likely the sophistication of the technology here, both for testing you to see if you truly have an appendicitis, as well as being able to treat you is fine. If it's anything more sophisticated than that, you will move up to the higher one. But the point here is that there is connectivity, and this is a key in making integrated delivery systems work, is that we do have connectivity. And the goal is to move that connectivity, as far as information is concerned, out to the other parameters that we have not done so in the past. Those community-based hospitals that we're building are very much consolidated, both in their technology and what they do. And I don't want to say much more about that, but when you go to a community-based hospital, you're not going to have the sophistication as these tertiary care hospitals. So they're, they're very cost-effective because of the level of the personnel in there and the sophistication of the technology. What I do want to point out to you is that the tertiary care teaching hospital facilities that are part of the integrated delivery system have changed very much. And there's two areas that we'll talk about. One is the point of care testing and the information control center. So if you can envision in your mind living in a community where you have physicians' offices, you have group clinics by physicians, you have specific diagnostic clinics like a diabetic clinic, then you have your community or your primary based hospital and you have numerous of them, some with specialties and some with not, and then you have one or two of these primary tertiary care hospitals that if you get real sick and you need that level of sophistication, you will go there. So the key is by building this particular system, I'm going to keep my cost down and I'm going to be able to deliver health care at every level, hopefully in a cost-effective manner for this community. Now the piece I told you about was the other side was the imaging. Now for the non-laboratorians in the group, hematology is the study of blood. And what's happened over the years is that We've developed great hematology analyzers, and those are the things that will do the white counts and the red counts and the platelets and all those kinds of things for you. And they're very sophisticated, they're very fast, and they're very accurate. However, there's a segment of that that still is very labor-intensive, and that is, suppose you have an elevated white count, and I need to distinguish whether you're a leukemic patient or you have some kind of massive infection that's increasing the white cells. I need to look at the white cells. And in all the cancer institutions in the world, the white cell identification becomes a very important segment in the diagnosis. So the first thing that happened as far as the diagnostic end of it with the vendors, they made what they say a slide maker stainer. And all that means is that when you want to look at the cells, you have to take a drop of blood and put it on a slide and smear it, let it dry, you stain it, and you put it under the microscope. There's a large variable there. When I make a slide, I make it thicker than you, I don't do it as well as you, all my cells go to the side. There's a lot of variables. So they created this piece of technology, very simple, that standardized that procedure. That was the first step in getting to this area. Now what they have is called imaging technology, where I used to have to take that slide, or anyone in the lab, and many people still do it because this is brand new technology, you have to sit down at a microscope, put the slide down there, and very carefully count a hundred cells and identify each one of them and put them into an appropriate category. It's very labor intensive, especially if you're under chemotherapy because your cells become very weird or if you're a leukemic patient and you have a lot of premature cells, it takes a very high level of sophistication and it's very expensive to have this done, but you have to do it. This kind of technology also lends itself, as you'll see, that you can get inputs from other hospitals. So I told you that the tertiary care hospital is a very sophisticated institution and that the community hospitals are much lower level. So it's very rare that you would find somebody in the community hospital that would be able to identify a hairy cell leukemia. But via this technology, I can take the cell and send it over the web 
to the central lab or the tertiary care lab and have the expert there identify that cell. So, this is what happens. We have now replaced the microscope with a CRT. Is this good? Is this bad? You walk into a hematology lab and you tell them that I'm taking away your microscope, you would think you were taking away their child. Am I right? <laughs> so, hematologists take great pride in being able to identify cells and they feel that they separate themselves from the crowd because they have this expertise, and it is an expertise. But the problem with hematology differentials, it's a variable. If we gave the same slide to everyone in this room, and you were all laboratorians, we would come up with a variety of different answers. They might not be wrong, but they would be different answers, and they would be different cells category based on our interpretation. Software has changed that. The systems now can very easily identify the cells and identify them accurately. Cells are pre-classified and grouped and sorted, all by the computer. Compares image data and the CBC results, so that analyzer that did the white count does all kinds of other things like plotting. So it takes all the data and puts it together to make the correct decision. That's more than I was doing when I was looking at the differential. It scans for abnormal cells and it looks at the morphology of the red cells and it presents them to me. And then all I have to do is sit in front of the screen and if I agree by looking at the cells with the computer, I can release and let it go. So, what are the benefits of such a thing? Standardization, that's the best thing. It standardizes the process, one that was a large variable is now standardized because the computer has a set of rules that it makes its decisions on and it will go ahead and every time it holds to those rules. Improve identification of abnormal cells because they're so hard to identify. Again, the computer doesn't variate from its decision process, so it will do that. It will facilitate collaboration between peers. There is a group in Canada that uses this technology Instead of me sitting down in front of the microscope trying to decide what it is, and if you've ever done this, if I found a, a great cell and I wasn't sure what, I, what it was and I needed someone with more expertise, I would typically get up and go over and find this person. If you touch the table, you never find that cell again because it moves it on the slide and you just can't find it. It's an impossible task. This computer knows exactly where every cell that you looked at or it looked at and can take you back to that cell at any given time. So it's great for laboratorians to get together with their CRTs and make a decision as a group as compared to what the computer said. And it streamlines the training and the education. We do a lot of cross-training now in the laboratory. The chemistry people are doing hematology, the hematology are doing chemistry. This is on a CRT. We can look at it together just like I'm looking at the screen and say, what do you think that cell is? And I don't need to have them sit down at the microscope and readjust it. So it has a lot of advantages there. So the achieve a standardization means that it uses the same area of the slide every time to locate the cells. All cells are pre-classified and cells are viewed at a consistent format. So this is what you get. So when I counted the 100 cells, I would have to sit down and just make a number. Say, I saw one segmented neutrophil, I saw one lymphocyte, and then I would try to separate them because they really have diagnostic value. But now the software is doing it for me. And so all I'll have to do is look at it. And if I decide that this is not a lymphocyte and this is a band cell, I can just electronically move it to the next category without any problem at all. So why would I buy this? What is technology? What has IT done for me? Well, let's go where the problem is. As you know, we have a growing elderly population. What is the fastest growing disease entity in the world is cancer. And as soon as you go to an oncologist, the first thing that happens to you is that your white cells go and you get what we call a leukopenia. It means that you have very few white cells. And when you have very few white cells, it is extremely labor intensive to find the cells. And it's very important that you find the cells and identify them. So we did a study where we compared the qualified techs in the lab looking at how many cells they could find versus the technology. Big difference. 
and the physicians appreciate this because they can better predict the impact of the chemotherapy that they're using on the patient. So this is important. This is important as far as outcome, labor components, educational components, the whole gamut. If you look at what it takes, if you, if you standardize it, which we did in one of our studies, we said, what does it take from the time I get the blood sample all the way down as far as time of staining it, preparing it, reading it under the microscope? It takes me seven minutes and 20 seconds on the average for a qualified laboratorian to read one slide. Then I implemented the slide stainer maker, which is an easy process. And it didn't really impact it too much. I got a decrease of about two minutes on it. But when I put the automatic imaging system, wow, big change. And then what we did, we said the average in the country for a community-based hospital is that they probably do 100 slides a day. And look at the difference, okay? 12.1 hours to do 100 slides on a manual, 1.9 versus the high technology and the interpretation of the computer of the cells with greater accuracy all along and all those other benefits. So it becomes a no-brainer to do it, right? It's truly a benefit. It's, it's, it's technology and software working at its best and it's just beginning to penetrate the hematology laboratory. This particular center, we saved six FTEs we didn't let them go. They moved them to a different department. But it saved $395,000 in payment to those individuals to do those tasks. The technology was only $150,000. So there's quite a bit of savings, and that's a one-year payment, okay, one-time payment. Plus the ability to move the images. The first thing that was asked of me when I entered this hospital by the pathologist, the pathologist lived exactly two miles from the hospital and this was the cancer center. Can you move that image to my bedroom? And I thought she was kidding. But she said, you know how many times I get a call at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning to come to the laboratory to help identify some cells? Of course we can move it. So you can move it right to the CRT, whether they're down the hall or whether they're down the street. So you save that piece there also. So that's a good example of that. Now, let's get into the information technology. Like I said, my job for the last 20 years has been to go into hospitals, into integrated delivery systems, and look at the technology. Besides the consolidation of workstations, which is kind of reaching its end, and that's where we had a 10, 15 years ago, we had multiple analyzers to do these tests, and we've consolidated them now. The chemistry analyzers have menus of 100 tests where in order to get that 100 test menu, you had to have five, six, seven analyzers in the lab at one time to do your therapeutic drugs, to do your routine chemistries, all those kind of things. So that's changed, and that's had a tremendous impact. But the information system that one has truly has an economic and efficiency impact on a clinical laboratory. And this, I'm just focusing on the laboratory information and the assessing area in this last workflow analysis that I did. So I'm not going into chemistry and all of that. Right? So if you look at this, the first thing, they had a system that was just about nine years old, an LIS. And they didn't have a lot of pieces on it that most people have today. So what we said that if you went to a new LIS, the efficiencies from that software would bring you entry and barcode generation they would be able to do point of care database repository, medical data repository, medical necessity decisions, reference laboratory interface so that when you send stuff to a reference laboratory, it could just automatically be downloaded into the laboratory computer instead of writing the answers down. It would definitely improve their turnaround time of getting the results back to the physicians. The emergency department and other high costly areas in the hospitals, their length of stay, would definitely decrease because of this new information system and that we could easily see an accession reduction. The thing to keep in mind that many things that you do in the clinical laboratory, whether it be an LIS or whether it be this kind of technology I was talking about, can and does many times have an impact on turnaround time. Turnaround time in a hospital, especially a tertiary care hospital, means money. 
If I can take that patient and make a decision that he or she does not have to go into ICU or that the length of stay in ICU is shortened because of the laboratory data has shown that I can move that patient out of there, send them home or send them to another part of the unit, big dollars can be saved. So the first thing, the assessing area at this place that I just finished the workflow analysis, they had 12.6 FTEs on the day shift handling their session. It's a very busy hospital. There's a lot of blood samples coming in. There's, there's no barcodes on them, so they have to get the patient's name. They have to generate the barcodes. This is automatically done on an up-to-date LIS system. So we were convinced that they had a major bottleneck in this accessioning area, and it hindered the turnaround time. And because it hindered the turnaround time, we found out that they had a big problem. Now, think of a clinical laboratory that has a routine work going on. Every time that a physician decides that he or she wants a stat test, they need to interrupt the process because now this has a higher priority. And because their turnaround time was, was poor, physicians know how to gain the system. So what they did do is they said, this is a stat in hopes that instead of getting it back in four hours, they would get it back in an hour. So what they did is that they created this environment in their own hospital where the stat tests were priorities and all the other work was falling back. Now the stat tests, turnaround time, was going from an hour to two hours to two and a half hours because they had so many of them and it really hindered the process. The LIS impact alone, just on the assessing people that are moving this, if they switch the other one, they could reduce it by four to six FTEs, which is substantial. But what we did, instead of just saying, you can get rid of four to six FTEs by the utilization of this new technology, is we wanted to really emphasize the stats. And if you look at that, we took every one of their departments throughout the hospital, and we actually plotted out in a 24-hour period how many samples were sent to the laboratory for a stat request. And as you can see, this was a perfect example of most departments. They were sending stats 24 hours a day. They would get six tubes and they would send it down and say, these are stat, I need them back now. So it was really creating a tremendous lag in the turnaround time in the hospital, all because of the inefficiencies and not upgrading their laboratory information system. So. This is a staggering number, as you can see. Based on what we recommended, and I, if you see on the top, the four FTEs we were moving out of the lab, uh, assessing area. There were 22 techs that we really were recommending either could be moved someplace else or just let go. But, where did I have it? Uh, 16 of those techs was because the LIS system was a problem, because all these stats were generated. So it really was an informatics problem. Because of this informatics, all of this was happening at a cost which was over a million dollars. These others were insignificant when you look at that. It was a million dollar cost to that facility every year because they did not upgrade to the LIS. Why did they not upgrade? They thought they didn't want to spend the money, and they thought it would be a problem to bring the LIS up. To, it would create all kinds of learning programs throughout the hospital, all these other areas. But when they saw this number, they said, oh my God, it's costing. And this is, this is only a piece of it. If we went out there and we actually quantified the length of stay and the, the utilization and the people who would stay in the ER because the data wasn't coming back, it would have been even higher. Okay. So now let's move on to something that I think is, is really interesting uh, for me because it won't be too long because I will be in the home healthcare market myself as a user instead of a provider. But you must understand that in the world of healthcare, for the most part, people look at information technology not always in the great light that we would like them to look at it. They see it as a threat. They see it as, the, the hematologists see it, like it's taking some of their job away or it's going to take their expertise away and that why should we have to rely on this? We have the expertise. The, the home healthcare market or telehealth sites 
It's just the opposite. This is where I'm working, and I can tell you the individuals that are working in home health care and working in prisons and working in rural clinics are receiving anything that will help them with open arms, with open arms. They don't even question the cost because the costs are so high in this particular area. At the same time that we're providing information technology and other forms of technology, the diagnostic company is really beginning to produce little pieces of technology that are very mobile, the glucose. Now they have procedures that are non-invasive. You don't have to stick yourself anymore. We have multiple tests on the market. Matter of fact, in the States, we probably are reaching close to 70 of those that people can just go into a drugstore and buy. So the testing is really simple and it's fairly accurate at that point, unless you ask the chemist and then they always quantify that. Okay? But the key with this whole industry is connectivity. It does not work unless you have connectivity. Think of all the diabetics that you know that are out there now. They're home, they're doing glucose assays, but what do they do with that number? They do the test, they write it down, and if it's really elevated, they might call their health care provider. Other than that, that data is just sent to the wayside. And you'll see how that's changing. But this point of care technology that's being developed is really beginning to change the sites in where we do the tests. There was a prediction in 78 by Jim that this would happen, that the hospital being the primary testing site for diagnostics would change, and that it would really result into the physician's office laboratory because of where technology was going. Now you must understand, laboratorians hate point of care testing. It was the biggest threat that ever entered the laboratory because now you're taking my domain and you're sending it out there and you're giving people the empowerment to do their own test or to give a nurse or anybody else the power to do a test. And we will criticize it until we die, saying they will not do it right because they're not laboratorians. But the fact is that the diagnostic vendors have changed the technology so much that they can do a fairly accurate job of doing point of care testing. To do, not the real sophisticated, they're not going to do genetic testing, but they're going to do glucose and they're going to do kidney function tests and they're going to do possibly some drug tests and coagulation tests. If you look at the West Coast, here's a perfect example. The Pacific Northwest. Look at their testing sites. The dominant testing site, not the dominant test, but the dominant testing site is the physician's office. So it tells you that in a large integrated system, we're not using the laboratory as much as we did for all of the tests. We are now allowing physicians to do testing when the patient is in his or her office. Why? This article tells you why. Because it is cost effective. Because if I can make a decision about the patient at the time that he or she's in there, if I do a glucose and I see it's still elevated and I look at my records and it was elevated, elevated last time, I might want to do a hemoglobin A1C to see if the patient is compliant. And it becomes a very cost-effective tool. So that's why it's, the technology is better and it has its economic benefits in healthcare. So let's look at the macro and the microeconomics of telehealth in the home. And I just put this up, I hope I don't insult anybody, I just wanted to make sure that people understood what I meant by macro and micro. Because macro being the, the governments, the governments see that something's happening, they have to do something about it in order to make change. And then the micro being, well, how do we go ahead and work that system that we still maintain a profit? And I think the home health care in the United States is a perfect economic example of how the industry responds to one another. Government or big business makes a decision and then how do we still work the system that we make a profit? So let's just think, the population is getting healthier. We all feel healthier, right? We all do things that we didn't do 10 years ago. They tell us to be careful what we eat. They tell us to do exercise. They tell us to do this. So we are healthier. And because of that, we are living longer, which the government says, oh my God, they're living longer. That's a problem. 
right? What am I going to do with them? United States, it means that they're going to go into the Medicare system. Oh, my God. And there's so many of them, right? So, let's look at what the trends are. And if you put yourself in the place of the government, and if you were running for office around 2030, boy, you're going to have your hands full. Because now you have 69 million people over 65, and they're all qualified for government health care in the United States. And the people who are paying the taxes are getting smaller and smaller. So we have all these baby boomers that are out there, and they're growing, and the government is saying, what do I do about it? Right? So, and we are creating the baby boomers. And what about the baby boomers? The baby boomers are smart people because UIT people gave them access to the web. And then when they go in to see the physician, they know exactly what they have. And they go, I don't want that drug. Did you order this lab test? Da -da -da. So they're challenged. And they know what, maybe they know, but they think they know when they go into the physician's office, what's best for them. Or at least they have a good idea. They're far more educated now than they've ever been. And they will be far more educated because of IT in 10, 15 years from now. So, let's look at their case mix. Right now, these seem to be the five prominent areas of the 65-year-old. Most of them chronic, most of them extremely costly to the healthcare system. So, we, we have a choice. We either have to figure out how we're going to do this or we're going to have to kill them all off because it's going to break the bank if we don't do something real soon. So, this is their strategies. Well, let's reduce length of stay in the hospital. We've done that, right? We push them out faster than they, they didn't even know they were in the hospital and they're going home, right? We hand them the bag, right? We utilize less expensive health care service, like home health care. We've been pushing. Oh, you're good enough to go home. That's right. We'll send a nurse's aide out to, to look after you. Shift the services to ambulatory care. Better disease management. Reduce those hospital encounters. We don't want them back. Stay home, please, okay? Because every time you come back, it costs the health care some money. Screen for early detection disease. Oh. Now, how many times have you heard that? Early detection disease is a good economic thing to do because if I find that you have atherosclerosis and I can change your diet, in the long run, it will pay for itself. Data availability. So you're going to talk about diabetes. Everyone talks about diabetes. It's a big cost problem for anybody in healthcare. And there are 14 million possibly another six million that have not even been diagnosed. And it's not the diabetes. It's a secondary problem. Retinopathies, renal failure, neuropathies, atherosclerosis. That's what costs health care big bucks. Not the diabetes itself. If I can get all the diabetics to do a good job in monitoring their glucose, I can keep those health costs down. Make sense? I mean, everybody in this room would have to say, okay, let's do that. Right? Let's get the diabetics to do the tests well in advance. Well, I'm going to tell you as a laboratorian that for years now, we have a test. It's called microalbumin. Microalbumin can tell the patient and tell the physician if you are beginning to enter what we call end-stage renal failure, which means that your kidneys are starting to decline. 